Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so so normal hackathon, we had to go through usual stuff. The URL champion in the client side validation, SQL injection, XML injections were kind of new to me too. XSL, you know, forum cryptanalysis too to a bit, and then brute force attacks, and even go to a dosing uh, an application through a known vulnerability in that app. So normal normal hackathon stuff. At the end of the day, or rather half day, Alex and I finished in the top two uh, of, on the scoreboard for the entire class, which is, was awesome. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> or, or so we thought. <laughs> but we asked. <laughs> yeah, we said, so what's the perfect score? And they said, oh, the perfect score is 11,000. You guys, you know, just barely scratching it. And, and they also said, nobody ever got to the top score. So we thought, oh, okay, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Security Innovation was also kind enough to leave the environment open for a few more days. And they, they basically told us, go home and keep hacking and keep learning. And that's what we did. We went home and, and kept uh, uh, exploiting, uh, finding and exploiting those vulnerabilities in this web application. And both Alex and I, separately and combined, uh, um, we got to 9,000 plus points. Much better, but. Yeah, that was still, we still didn't hit the tops, and I was like, come on, you've challenged us, we gotta get there. And we're sitting there, it's Sunday night, it's like eight hours left till they turn off the servers, and we're like, let's, let's just you know, try something else, let's just keep scratching our heads. And, they said we're yeah. gonna turn it off on Monday morning. Yeah, so, what do right. we do? So we decided that uh, we're probably going to waste a lot of time trying to find the, those vulnerabilities that they coded, and we should look for something that was not intended there to, for there to be. So we started impromptu hacking, and you know from your te textbooks on hacking, uh, that's what it looks like, you know, reconnaissance, research, try, exploit, profit, repeat, but in, in reality, you know, it's, it's a lot of frustration, trial and error, um, some alcohol involved, <laughs> maybe maybe other substances. Yeah, you, you've heard on today's talk, if you were in the keynote, I mean, it's it's rarely this textbook example, it was just a lot of bashing and drinking. Yes. <laughs> Good. All right, so, so I'll, I'll give a quick foray into how, how hackathons are built. So for those of you who haven't been on the other side of things can understand. By the way, there's a talk in, um, that, 30 like minutes, two, two right, Topper is talking about how he put together this CTF for this conference, so if you're interested in actually learning how it's done, then go to that talk too. But uh, in reality, it's built by hackers, for hackers, right? So obviously they know all the other vulnerabilities and they, they're not just gonna leave you with a privask there, um, so they shut everything tight and obviously the training company, they wanted to make sure that they keep it all closed and as we realized much later, what we were dealing with, there was a bunch of hardened um, AWS Linux boxes that had no normal tools, no, you know, you can't just run Netcat and be happy there. Um, so no extras, all the challenges, everything was hard-coded into the app and compiled. There was no databases, no text files, nothing to tamper with, and um, no public inbound except for port 80, no outbound either. So it's like, oh man, <laughs> that's really tough. <laughs> yeah, so we, we looked for those things like open ports and you know, nothing. And finally, we realized that some of the URLs have this dot .action uh, extension. And uh, I think Alex said, oh, yeah, this looks familiar. I, I bet it, they use an Apache Struts. Yeah. Okay, awesome. A anybody heard of Struts? <laughs> <laughs> Recently, no. <laughs> well, yeah, so we left the slide in. It was uh, done earlier, but obviously, you know, it was, it was um, in, Mar in uh, April, right? Uh, no, we were doing this like end of March. So, yeah. you know, we were Two browsing, after. going out after the exploits and looking at certain exploits, and we come up against this thing that's, you know, CV 2017, and remember this number, 5338. It's like, apparently it's 5638. I can't read English. All right, so, so it's a, it's a, CVSS score 10, it's like, all right, <laughs> and, and it's fairly recent, so how about we try it? it? Looks like Struts is there. Yeah, so we thought, why not? Maybe they haven't patched yet. So it's a couple of weeks after the, the actual release of the, the, the vulnerability. So we ran a tool called Metasploit, 
framework, and they already had an exploit for that. I mean, they, we just searched for struts, and they had six or seven, and this, was, this one was the most recent. And we just put the parameters, the, the host name, the port. Yeah, and we're like, hey, we're going to have some time to sleep today, too. Yeah, so we said, <laughs> okay, Metasploit is going to do it for us. And it, and it kind of did. So when we, hit, when we uh, put the check command, it said, yay, the target is vulnerable. Awesome. Not quite. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it said vulnerable, but then when we tried creating sessions, nothing happens. Like, you can't get out, we can't communicate, nothing. It's like, so the only little piece of information we had is like, it, it says it's vulnerable, so it, it, hopefully it's not lying to us. It's promising, but we cannot get shell or, or remote command execution. So we yeah. started looking into that. You're good. Okay. Yeah. So we, we, um, first of all, we, we, we're trying to understand how, how, the, how Metasploit was checking that it's vulnerable. So we ran the traffic through um, intercepting proxy, and we used burp for here. On the top, uh, you see this is the request that, that Metasploit was sending, and on the bottom is the response. Uh, the request is looking kind of funny, but the, the highlighted text is what's important. If you, if you look closely at it, uh, this, uh, you can see it's, it's looking like Java. Um, it's calling a certain Java method, get proper, uh, system get property with os.name parameter, and, and then it puts the result into uh, just a random header. And on the response, here is this header with the value. So it is running a Java method to get the operating system name and returning back to Metasploit, that's how it knows that it's vulnerable. And you can see it's using this funky language that's called OGNL, which we just recently learned people in Java world called Ognal. <laughs> so it's using Ognal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so the next thing, pop open, you know, find the exploit, open up the Ruby exploit, the Metasploit is running and start reading the code and it's like, what, what, how, how does it work? How is it checking? And, you know, you can see in, in this Ruby code, it's putting together the Ognal thingy and um, it actually, is, what it's doing internally is it goes over and starts um, setting up the Symfony. Ognal is a library that uh, Apache um, has and developed for internal language processing. Um, and this thing comes up. It, it's kind of obscuring this. Um, but, well, so, so you, you'll see later too. Uh, uh, well, not here later. Um, it also goes into uh, setting up excluded classes. Basically, it removes all the security precautions that Ognal has internally, just basically calling saying, clear, clear, clear this stuff out and, and go and pop the OS name system property into the header and then return that header. Now, this thing worked, the check worked, the exploit thing didn't. So we were tasked with, now we need to make this thing work somehow. Yeah, we wanted to get something useful running on the server. So we, we tried a few things, and of course, uh, we, we did not intend to write something in Ruby, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, instead, we used the CURL command, or curl, uh, which is a really nice little tool that can send any kind of HTTP request and, and show you the response. So in this case, we uh, built a curl command to send, um, um, uh, to send a request to our vulnerable server, and this is the header that, that is custom, and we, as, as you can see, we're trying to run a, a remote command, basically, uh, with a reverse shell. Right, and it's a bash reverse shell. If you're not familiar with this, this is the thing to have. Like, you don't, if you don't have Netcat, that's the way to get a reverse shell, if, if you have outbound network. <laughs> and it didn't work. All right. So, so the next thing we've tried, all right, let's try to just find a file and read from a file. So we built in some Java code into that and put a file and and we were able to actually get and read and put something into um, into one of the headers to return the content. So it was like, all right, so we're getting there. So we, we, we could get the bits and pieces. Uh, we also tried to write a file. So we, we sent two headers instead of one uh, and one header contained a base64 base 64 encoded uh, file content, and then the code here got that header, uh, if I can read it, it's difficult to read, here it is. And then it would uh, decode, and then write to file, 
and then we, we were hoping that we would just execute it on the server and get something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe it worked. Uh, we had no way to check. Right. It was the server was always silent to us, and then and then it took a little while, and that dawned on us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we kind of realized that we tr we overcomplicating things, and it should be easier than that. And after a couple hours, maybe three, four hours, we came up with this. And uh, this is the end result of our um, hacking. And what this little script does is it does some prep work. Uh, there are some variables, you know, with server name and, and the path to, to the application on the server. It creates um, just a file name with a timestamp. And we use that file to so we run a, so we know, we know we can run a command on the server. The problem is how how do you get the result of that command? Because the server cannot communicate back to you. So we thought, okay, this is a web server. Why can't we just run the command, redirect its output to a file, and then just retrieve that file from that web server? And that's what we tried, and surprisingly, it worked. Um, so here we just. Uh, um, the dollar one is the command that we run, and it redirects to our output file, and blah 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 runs the process, and we don't care, you know, about the process anymore. Uh, we just want uh, want to wait for it to, to finish, and then on the bottom, the, this little curl command on the very bottom is just a plain HTTP GET for that file, uh, the name of which we know, because yep. we created it ourselves. And then we went all out. <laughs> so once we got this going, yay, let's exfil everything we we can. It's like, hey, let's go out after you know get get Etsy, get opt, get a user, get you know all the content from the server we can get, and we got everything. Yeah, basically we run commands to to read everything that that web user was able to read. Yeah, and the most important thing that came was the content of the actual. Hackathon. That was the WAR file, the web application, you know, Java compiled code. And obviously, what do you do when you get a compiled code? Well, you decompile it. And JDGU is an excellent tool. Decompile, look at it, see those add completed challenges, and see those unique identifiers for those add completed challenges that are sent to their CNC server. And it's like, all right, I think we got there. Yeah, so we basically. We just uh, took that decompiled code and looked for all these at completed challenge occurrences with those unique strings, and we built our own Java class uh, that we were hoping to run on the server to just execute all these methods. And by doing that, it would send the commands, um, not the commands, but messages to, to the main, uh, to the scoreboard server to register that we finished them. And since we got all their libraries too, we just compiled against their libraries. Like, yeah, we don't care. Just <laughs> <laughs> and then the next thing was, how do we upload? How do we run it? But thankfully, they also they they had an uh, an upload vulnerable upload page that we abused. And intentional. Yeah, and actually that was intentional vulnerability. But we put put it as text, fake text, and renamed it with our command. And you know, the next thing was, hey. <laughs> Look yeah. at those timestamps. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you see how fast we hack? <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, getting 2,000 points in four seconds or something. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Thank you. So, so that was that was fun and games and everything. And, and Alex is going to talk a little bit about the responsible disclosure we did in the end, and you know all that kind of you know good feelings and stuff. But we wanted to talk about a little more profits. So here's another example. Here's, this is a training program. This is another sort of a hackathon training program, and it's awesome. It's it does pretty well. It's it's from ISAC. It's um, Cybersecurity and access, and it, what it does is also you complete a challenge, and it also reports your CPEs like the time you spend on hacking it and, and submits on your behalf. And I thought, ah, that's an interesting way. <laughs> Let's see what I can do with CPEs. So I did a little more. <laughs> so that was another hackathon. Uh, it was a different bug. It was shell injection. It was actually, yeah, shell injection in, uh, into Nmap. But there, you can do something else when people submit you know, CPEs on, on your behalf. You can submit a little more. So I thought, hey, I spent a lot of 
I'm thinking about it, maybe. <laughs> so for two hours of work, you got 20 hours of CPE. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nice. that's fine. Nice, nice profit. Uh, yeah, but you know, if we were smarter. <laughs> so when the Equifax thing came out, uh, they, they kind of hinted right away that it was Apache Strat's thing. And then a week later, or a few days later, they actually confirmed officially that it was the same Apache Strat's vulnerability that they get hacked through, the same one that we exploited in that hackathon. Yeah, you, you, see, you see the number there? Right. You remember that number, right? 56, 38. So um, real life consequences, uh, it's, it's not fun anymore. Um, I, I, I'm sure I'm one of those 145 million people uh, and my information is out there. Yeah, if you yeah, ever I doubted that your information was out there, it, it's out there now. <laughs> Don't doubt it. <laughs> and it was happening about the same time, essentially. All right, so, so you know, quickly, what, what does this whole thing mean to you if you're not you know, putting together hackathons? Obviously, you, know, you, you gotta know what's deployed in your system, you gotta watch for the recent CVEs, and you gotta understand what your application, you gotta scan for vulnerabilities. This is, I'm not breaking anything new here, it's you know, you knew the, the usual cyber you know, hygiene and perform pen testing. But the other thing that's kind of important here, and that's in, in, the, in the light of the Aquifax, I mean, they get, they got hacked pretty fast too. And this, you know, the security innovation, we, we were able to get in fairly fast too. Um, there's a certain period of time bef before it comes out and somebody hacks in where you, you can't really do anything. So a second level of defense would have definitely helped. If they had a WAF, uh, a web application firewall that had signatures, at least, you know, filtered out the freaking Agnol thing. <laughs> you don't need it. Why? Who, who does use it? And it's like when we were looking at there's almost no documentation on it either. It's like, come on, use, use some other method of protection. Know that you're going to be hacked at some point. What, what's the other thing that's going to stop or at least slow them down? And if you're a developer, meaning you develop an application or a website or just a company that has a, a web presence, you gotta watch, you know, you gotta know what libraries you're using, you gotta, if, if there's an issue with them, you need to release your patches promptly as well. Handle responsible disclosures, uh, meaning uh, somebody comes to you and says, hey, your website is vulnerable and here's how I can hack it. Don't just uh, turn them into FBI, you know. Work with them, because they're nice people, they're trying to help. And that's what we did also, we reported this to Security Innovation they handled the situation very professionally. They um, told us exactly, uh, I mean, they were respectful. They told us what they're planning to do. They asked us to wait on publishing this until they fix it. We complied, of course. Um, and uh, it was a very good uh, experience. Uh, I think we, 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 sent, we sent the report like at 1, 1 a.m. and we got a response Ten minutes later, or yeah, from a salesperson. <laughs> Their salespeople don't sleep. <laughs> he was our only point of contact at uh, at the company. So, yeah. Anyway. All right. That's that's a that's quick it. summary. <laughs> yep. Thank you, guys. Thank you.